actually beginning the class. We're covering rule 12. Let me read it one more time. The web pulsates, it contracts and expands. Let the magician seize the midway point and thus release those prisoners of the planet whose note is right and justly tuned to that which must be made. And there's two sections. One is interludes and cycles. And the next section, which we're going to cover today, is the prisoners of the planet. But let's recap here about the midway point. Anyone remember what the midway point is about? Okay, remember the interludes? What's the two interludes? You breathe out, and what's the first interlude the intake there? And the, out, the right. intake and the release. Right. You breathe out, and then you can have an interlude where you have a period of silence where you focus on what you're creating, and then you breathe in, symbolizing breathing in your uh, uh, ideas. And then you have the interlude, which is where you connect with the soul to bring down an idea. So basically, the interlude goes like this. You breathe in, and you, you focus on gathering your energy so you can become, begin a new endeavor. But what is that new endeavor going to be? You hold the interlude and you get an idea from a higher source, okay, during this first interlude. You take this idea and you breathe out and you create. And then you, in the second interlude, you concretize that creation so it uh, manifests in the real world. So you have these two interludes. And the magic happens during the interlude, he points out. Now, you'll notice a lot of people breathe, they have no interlude. And other people breathe, and they do have a short interlude. And in meditation, sometimes a person can make longer interludes. But to have a longer interlude, it has to be kind of a conscious endeavor, because you don't normally have a, have a very long interlude in your, in your normal breathing. And this is symbolic of the magical work. The magical work that in the interludes just doesn't happen spontaneously. It happens when the, the magician consciously creates the interlude. And then uh, he says he seizes the midway point and thus releases the prisoners of the planet whose note is right and justly tuned to that which must be made. So we're gonna talk a little bit about these prisoners of the planet because the magician, uh, the white magician, the worker in the light, one of his main purposes is to help those of a lower kingdom, of a lower manifestation, of a lower uh, evolution or maybe a better way to word it is just they're a little bit farther back on the path than than he is, and to help them um, get to where he is. And so this is the work of releasing the prisoners on the planet. And to do this, he has to seize the the various midway points. And there's all kinds of midway points. There's points between each cycle has a midway point. The cycle goes up and then down and in between that is a midway point. And where you have the shift, that's where the decisions are made to uh, uh, take advantage of the energy uh, swinging back and forth. He says here, we come to, uh, the great purpose of white magic, which is to release the prisoner of the planet, it would profit us therefore to study who these prisoners are and what is the mode of their release to be employed by the working disciple. 
Inclusively, he says they constitute all forms of life that we usually call subhuman, but these words must be given wider connotation. And he points out that it goes beyond the subhuman clear up to the uh, planetary logos is also a prisoner. Uh, so we have, uh, wherever there's form, that form, and there's life in the form, that form constitutes a prison. And there's all different types of prisons, and all of us are in it to one de degree or another. And that form must be mastered so that the prisoner can become free. In our essential spiritual essence, before we uh, had any incarnation, we were completely free. There was nothing holding us anywhere. And, uh, but on the other hand, we must have been somewhat bored in that com state of complete freedom, where there was nothing constraining us from anything we wanted to see or, or have. So what we decided and what the entire life, one life that rules the universe decided, of which we are all a part, so we all decided that it would be interesting to limit ourselves. To limit ourselves, by limiting ourselves, we could then challenge ourselves to remove those limitations. And that would be kind of exciting, interesting, challenging thing to do. So we decided we wanted, to, we wanted this challenge. Now what's funny about it is now that we're down here and we undergo pain, suffering, uh, difficulties, we grumble about these challenges. But that which we're now grumbling about and uh, sometimes even cursing God about, we volunteered to have. We, we wanted this just like, uh, just like if you're going to be a football player, you, you go in and you may get a concussion, uh, you may get injured, uh, you have to go through a lot of painstaking uh, labor to get in shape. There's all kinds of things you could grumble about. You may grumble about your teammates or not, uh, they're kind of irritating or whatever. Lots of things are grumble about, but then when you win the big game, it's all worth it. Okay. And this is what we kind of faced. We decided to create this big game that we could come down and see if we could master the whole thing. We wanted a challenge and basically that's what we got. Uh, most of us, anybody here have not enough challenge in their life? How about you, Melba? Do you feel uh, you need some more challenge or you got enough? Well, I seem to have sufficient challenge to keep me busy. <laughs> okay. I don't know anybody that wants more. <laughs> I think we did a good job of devising uh, uh, life so we have all we can handle. And that's kind of one of the things I teach is, is we do have a, one life out of seven approximately where we have it kind of easy and a little bit of rest period. But six out of seven people have all they can handle in their life. And even the seventh usually thinks he has plenty. Oh, there's very few people that uh, uh, think they need, need more challenge. There's a handful, but not very many. He says there's a, uh, he talks about different divisions here. Like he says, first of all, um, the substance of all forms or the multiplicity of tiny atomic lives through which the power of thought are drawn into the form aspect through which all existences and all souls, mineral, vegetable, animal, and the body of man express themselves. Okay, this is part of the uh, form that constitutes prisons for all the way from the uh, uh, atomic life to the vegetable, animal, man, and even higher. 
Intelligence, he says, is drawn from spirit into matter, which creates a prison of limitations from which we must eventually escape. So we're a little bit like Houdini. Houdini made himself a, a prison and uh, makes a cage of some kind and, and puts it underwater and he has to escape, okay? And if he can figure out a way to escape it, then he, he's uh, thrilled about it and his audience is thrilled. So we're, we're a little bit like Houdini, the fact that uh, we, we created this prison, now we jump into it and now we got to figure out a way to get out of it and survive. And uh, so it's kind of an interesting thought there. He says, matter is energized or lifted up in the occult sense of the term by its contact with spirit. Spirit in its turn is enabled to enhance its vibration through the medium of its experience in matter. Now that's an interesting thought. We often think of spirit enhancing matter and bringing us up. But here he points out that matter also is a benefit to spirit. And he says the interplay of spirit and matter and all this situation and incarnation we go through enhances the vibration of spirit through the medium of its experience in matter. So matter, spirit comes into matter, interplays with it, and... Uh, eventually removes the limitations. When the limitations are removed, then both matter and spirit are enhanced. The bringing together of these two diverse aspects results in the emergence of a third, which we call soul. And through the medium of the soul, spirit develops a sentiency and a conscious awareness and a capacity to respond which remains its permanent possession when divorce between the two comes around eventually and psychically. So after the experience of uh, creation, being trapped in form and then being freed from form, he says uh, uh, spirit has uh, increased capacity and uh, it remains its permanent possession. So that which we, our life essence acquires by coming down here and undergoing everything we have to go through, uh, the essential things, light that is gathered remains our permanent, permanent possession. It says all matter must be lifted up to spirit by life sacrificing itself as a temporary prisoner. And this he points out that matter itself has to be redeemed. And to redeem matter, uh, spirit incarnates in the matter and sacrifices itself. And so it becomes identified with matter and then eventually works its way out. And by working its way up, it lifts matter up to spirit. As they say, matter is merely spirit slowed down is what I think Blavatsky said. He says there are many prison, prisons that must be transcended for even speech and books limit and must be transcended by a mental telepathy. Now, this is something that he has predicted that we eventually won't even have to talk. We'll have mental telepathy with each other. He doesn't say how long that will be, but uh, uh, I would, uh, I'd guess it's going to be sometime in the future. I don't uh, know anybody that doesn't have to speak some, <laughs> at least today, to communicate. Now, if you offend somebody, you can often tell by looking at them what they're thinking. Um, or if you please somebody, you can sometimes tell what they're thinking just by the feel or the, the look. So sometimes as just even ordinary people communicate quite a bit without speech. I know when my wife gives me a certain look, it's like a book's worth of information sometimes. <laughs> and I know pretty much what she's thinking. 
but uh, it still, even though you're close to somebody, you need to, to um, we, we're not beyond words. And books, that'd be something to live in a world where you didn't need books to learn from. So uh, maybe it's like the cartoon says that you can just sleep on a book and know everything that's in it the next morning. <laughs> so it'd be, now he talks about the archives of the masters and they, uh, they have books or scrolls with, but instead of words, he, he talks, there, some of their archives are written in symbols. And the symbols have various colors to them. So the colors mean something, the shape means something, and they can tell by a glance almost a book's worth of information by looking at some of these symbols. So uh, it looks like even the masters need some, have uh, recordings that they uh, use. He says, we must learn to see the whole, ponder, on how this can be done. DK's books just scratch the surface. And uh, he says they're, it's like te grade school, his stuff, he says, compared to what is to come. Okay, most people who read his books think, boy, this is the most complicated, advanced stuff I've ever read. But he says this is just, just really grade school stuff compared to what is to come. So you can imagine what is to come. And most people, he kind of hints that the next major revelation will be given in 2025. It's only uh, less than six years away now. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens in that time. There's kind of probably going to be a dozen or more people claiming to be DK speaking. And uh, the only way to tell for sure will be to read it and and have your soul verify the quality of the, of the material. Okay, to prepare, he says, we need to learn to be telepathic and intuitive. Then these form of words and these ideas clothed in form will not be needed. You can then stand face to face with the naked truth and live and work in the terrain of ideas and not in the world of form. Well, that's one thing that we can relate to is if you have an idea, once the idea is registered and you communicate the idea with somebody else, it communicates more than words. You can take an idea and make a whole book about it, okay? So if you can communicate the idea in say five minutes to somebody, it's in one way almost like communicating a book's worth of uh, uh, usable material because uh, an idea is, uh, is a fantastic uh, way to communicate. And sometimes you can communicate an idea in just a handful of words if the person is sensitive and kind of tunes into what you're trying to get at. And other times it takes a lot of words to communicate an idea. And some people, you can communicate an idea with just a small number of words and then other people a little bit denser and it takes a lot of words to communicate the same idea. And people that are not open to new ideas, doesn't matter how many words you use, sometimes you cannot uh, uh, get, get through to them no matter what. He says, the second prisoner are those units of electrical energy which embody what we call the soul of things and which has been termed the anima mundi, the life and the soul, the one in whom all embodied existences live. In other words, uh, the soul of the entire planet is, uh, uh, is, is a prisoner of form also. He says, we're not equipped yet to understand uh, all these uh, units and prisons. To understand, we must see human humanity's relationship to the whole rather than the part. 
Humanity covers a wide range from incarnated adepts to those just a little above the animals. Okay, they're capable of a th uh, responsive, we're responsible to three energies. One, the spiritual energy from God through the monad to the individual. And second, the sentient energy, energy that makes a man a soul. He develops awareness and consciousness. And the nervous system working through the heart and the brain is a physical manifestation of this, of the soul. And the third is pranic energy or vitality. This is the force inherent in matter, matter itself. And this type of energy comes from the physical sun and works actively upon our bodies. So uh, the three types of energy then is comes from the monad, and that's pure spirit from the soul, and that's the love energy, and then prana, which is actual life-giving energy that comes from the sun, vitalizes us through our food and uh, through uh, the sun itself. In the terminology of the ancient wisdom, these three are called electric fire, solar fire, and fire by friction. For the soul is a vehicle of the monad and the body is a vehicle of the soul. Because humanity is sensitive to all these three energies, they uh, are a midway point, and the brain and the soul of the planet with each uh, of us being a cell, corresponding to an interlude where magic takes place. So you have these uh, midway points, the midway point between the monad and the soul, between the soul and our consciousness. And these midway points are all points where magic can take place. It says when humanity is still a receptive, then they perceive the purpose and the plans of God. The hierarchy represent those brain cells that use the interlude. Advanced humanity, the cells that do the thinking, and average humanity, those cells which are not put to much use. Humanity thus exists to link the higher and the lower. They are basically the soul of the universe, uh, manifesting divine ideas. And we must be uh, uh, diligent about being uh, uh, productive cells. So he points out that uh, like, we ourselves in the body of God, and we must learn to advance so that we can tune in to a higher life. And our very cells and atoms of our body are like lower lives that are trying to tune into us. So they tune into us, and we as a cell and a higher entity try to tune in to the higher. And so this is an eternal process that goes on. This is another type of activity which man is capable of is an intense progression and a spiral development within the human ring past nod. In other words, he is becoming and growing in consciousness. And we have the big debate between being and becoming. So it's it's not like one or the other. You're not uh, the de end desire isn't just being or becoming, but to use both of them. You have periods of becoming where we're at right now. We incarnate so that we can be stimulated into becoming more than we were before. And then when we go out of incarnation, we're more in a state of being. Humans are transmitting agents of spiritual force to the lower kingdoms and all the prisoners of the planet. We are rightly driven to find our soul and spiritual sources and take the journey home. But if this is all we do, then we're only halfway there. 
we must fulfill the Christ principle. But this is an important point that he points out, is that if all, we, if all we're gonna do is just journey home, then that's not enough. We gotta take others with us. If we don't do that, then we haven't accomplished what uh, uh, we set out to do. Uh, another, it's, uh, it always boils down to selfishness or unselfishness. So if we only see the part or the self, and work for that, then we are not accomplishing what we came here for, and we will be uh, uh, regress somewhat in our progression. But we always have to do it from the wholeness point of view, to look at pulling others up to where we are. And this is releasing the prisoners of the planet. And releasing the prison of the planet, the, um, the higher kingdoms, he points out, is always um, the savior of the lower kingdoms. And so the higher has a responsibility to stimulate that which is lower. And the lower is always in a more tightly held prison than the higher. As we move higher, we get more and more freedom and release ourselves from different aspects of the prison. And we have to help free the prisoners below us. It's a little bit like uh, even, even the uh, hardcore prisoners, if they find a way to escape and they can help their fellow inmates escape, you know, you watch all these movies, well, they'll help them even though they're selfish, hardcore prisoners. If they escape from a prison, they kind of feel sorry for the other guys, so they'll throw them a key to or help them, help them escape if, if it's feasible to do so. So it's, it's a natural thing to, if you can escape from a prison, you think, boy, it'd be great if other people could <laughs> escape also. One of the forces that lie back entirely of the evolutionary scheme is that of the principle of limitation. We talked a little bit about that. And uh, uh, our limitations are created by higher will and we must remove them with the power of will. And he talks about the difference between will and desire. Let's throw that question out to the group. What's the difference between will and desire? Well, um, I would think that desire comes, uh, comes for, uh, emanates from the lower self. Yeah, yeah. And you desire things of the past. You can only desire things you've seen or somebody else has seen or you've imagined based on past things. Okay. You will the future. So desire is kind of associated with wishing, kind of. You wish, you desire. But will is an actual force that you, you pick up from your higher self that uh, moves you forward to a higher purpose and accomplishment. Okay. Okay. Uh, he says a prisoner of the planet fall in two categories. First of all, those lower lives uh, that are trapped. And all, all these lower lives are, um, he says the lower lives are not conscious that they are prisoners. Now this is an interesting statement. And he says because they're not conscious they're a prisoner, they uh, do not suffer any pain. Uh, for instance, uh, even going down to an animal, an animal doesn't suffer some pain, but not, not nearly as much as us because it doesn't have a concept of the future or the past. So all it thinks of is, is what's happening right now. Now, if what's happening right now, if there's a, a forest fire or something like that, then the animal will have some fear. But uh, bearing that uh, right now nothing bad is happening, the animal will not fear. And then this 
is even intensified in the lower lives. The lower lives uh, have nothing to fear. They do not know they're in a prison. They do not have the consciousness for it. And so the benefit that they have, if you want to call it a benefit, is that they do not suffer. Now in the human kingdom, there's, we suffer a lot because of worrying about the future. We know what's happened in the past. Say if you say if you had a car accident in the past, uh, you may be worrying about a car accident in the future because you kind of connect the two there. So this, this memory and the mind principle creates a lot of problems in the fact that uh, uh, it creates a lot of suffering. And about 90% of the suffering is over things that never even happened. You know, you may worry about a lot of things that never materialize. So, so we have suffering from, you know, actual pain that we do go through, but also a lot of things we, that never materialize just because our mind is working overtime. So this this uh, also constitutes a prison for humanity, but there are two different types of prisons. With the lower lives, they do not actively work to free themselves from the prison because they don't realize they're in a prison. But we humans are just intelligent enough to realize that we are in a prison. What do you think? You think the average person realizes he's in a prison? Now, people realize it to different degrees. The Buddha, for instance, really realized it. He, when he, uh, uh, he kind of woke up to the idea that there was suffering and he think, this is terrible, I got to find a solution. And so he aggressively uh, looked for a solution to the problem of the prison that humanity finds himself in. And he was he was down to eating just like two, three grains of rice a day and starving himself trying to find the enlightenment or the solution to the whole problem. So he was just almost obsessed with freeing himself and humanity from the prison. But many people aren't aren't uh, don't have that uh, incentive at all. Um, what do you think it takes to to uh, uh, get, get that sense that you want to release yourself from a prison? Uh, let's pick on somebody here. Well, we'll pick on Ed. He's always got answered everything. Yeah, did you, uh, when, when did you realize that you had a prison you needed to escape from? Or did you? <laughs> JJ, I think you muted Ed, so he cannot unmute himself. No, I think he can. I can unmute it. Oh. Okay. Well, I, well I've, I've had various times where I felt that I was stuck, but I realized it was, I was stuck by my own action. Yeah. Good point. How about you, Adam? Have you uh, have you had a sense of uh, trying to escape from a prison? Oh yeah. Um, I think a lot of people enjoy their prisons. They get very comfortable in them. I know I do. Um, that's a really that's a really good point, Adam. Because you know, there's some prisoners that after the release, they'll go commit another crime because they'd rather be in prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are a lot of advantages to being in prisons um, of all kinds, even though maybe there's there's some awareness that they're not wholly free. We're not wholly free. But I think um, to answer your the first part of your question, I think it usually takes a lot of pain <laughs> um, and sometimes a lot of pain over time before the prisoner really wants to release himself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the the prisons that we have from the planetary logos, Sanat Kamara himself came to this planet with a commitment to be in this prison 
until the last weary pilgrim makes his way home. So he's here voluntarily sacrificing himself to come to the prison, a little bit like in the movie, you know, you see the maybe a good guy goes to prison to save somebody else that's in prison. There's been several series about people doing that type of thing. And uh, uh, that's a little bit like Sanat Kamara is. He's, uh, he's voluntarily uh, incarnated into the planet itself with his life force. And so the planet itself is a prison for him until he accomplishes his purpose and frees the prisoners that he came here to free. And the second group, he says, I think it has something yeah. to do, JJ. With, uh, I think it also has something to do with uh, <clears throat> where your heart's at. If uh, your heart uh, beats for humanity, you kind of release yourself from that prison. You know, uh, our heart basically beats for ourselves, but there's a change. There's a change in that uh, as you grow. And when you get to that point where the heart, your heart beats for humanity instead of self, you, you, you release that prison. You're released from that prison. Yeah. Yeah. And when you get released, like say, when you get released from a prison, especially if you're a decent person, you want to help others get released also. And it's interesting. He talks about the kingdoms. One kingdom is uh, the kingdom you're in will be responsible for the kingdom below. And he points out that humanity will become the saviors of the animal kingdom is one of the things he said a number of times. And who's the savior of the uh, uh, human kingdom? That would be the fifth kingdom, the kingdom of God where Christ and the masters dwell. They are our saviors. And above them, of course, is Shambhala. So there's always uh, the, these connecting links. And each, each higher kingdom is, is more free, but they're still in prison. They release themselves from one prison, but still they found new barriers that they have to release themselves from. And uh, then the animals, I don't know how the animals, uh, uh, I guess animals be benefit the vegetable life. Uh, I'm not sure how that works. He does point out that controlling the animal kingdom is a great, powerful entity that's completely self-conscious, unlike animals that are unconscious. And he says this great entity is incarnated into the animal kingdom and sacrificed himself to and that's part of the effort to uh, move the animals forward. So um, other places he's talked about not just one entity but a number of masters work in redeeming animals, vegetables, even the mineral kingdoms. But a number of very high entities work with the various kingdoms in the way that we're completely oblivious to. But another great sacrifice uh, to become a prisoner of the planet is a solar angel itself, our higher self. Our higher self has sent a portion of his energy down into our physical body. And uh, we are a, a prison for our, our higher self. So we have to make that connection and uh, remove the barriers to free the prisoner of the planet, which is us, which is really our, uh, our higher self, our soul. And then uh, there's lives who are limited in form, he says, because they're not self-conscious. And he said, like I say, they they're not, don't have an awareness or anything, and they're dependent on us. So we have uh, the vegetable lives, the mineral lives, the atomic lives, all these little lives. Everywhere there's form, there's some life in the form. And if it's not self-conscious, for it to be freed, uh, 
it is dependent on higher lives that understand what freedom is and are, are trying to remove the limitations. So the fact that we have self-consciousness is a tremendous benefit for us humans because we realize that, uh, that we have limitations we have to remove. These lower lives don't realize that. They have the benefit of not having any pain or anything, but uh, they don't know they are in prison and we have to stimulate these lower lives. And one of the way we stimulate them is the various atoms of the world eventually make themselves and uh, circulate through human bodies. And when they circ circulate and become a part of our physical body, they are stimulated and they have an opportunity to tune in to our consciousness. And the atoms of the earth itself have an opportunity to tune into the consciousness of the planetary logos also. And so they're stimulated by the planetary logos, but they get extra stimulation when they go through an animal body or a uh, particularly a human body. And he points out that the most evolved parts of the human body, can you guess what that is? What is the most evolved part of the human body? The brain. No. If you were an atom, if you were an atom and wanted to go to the most uh, enlightened part of the entire body, where would you go? The hand, your hands. No. Yeah. The heart. Pineal no. gland. I think somebody said it. Somebody. Pineal gland. Pineal gland. However. Well, that's heart. probably pretty high, but that's not the highest. Not it. Right. Who said that? Right. Who said the eye? Oh yeah, okay, it's the eye. Ah, That's what DK okay. says is, a, is a, the eye has the elements that are most uh, closest to spirit. So I found that kind of interesting statement. So uh, if you were an atom trying to, trying to move upwards, you'd wanna be a focus, uh, <laughs> be a part of the human eye. And uh, so anyway, anywhere in the human body is, is stimulating for uh, uh, the various uh, little, little tiny atomic lives. And uh, they're all prisoners of the planet. They don't know they're prisoners, but when they become a part of the human being, they eventually, uh, they're stimulated with a higher awareness and a higher these. I don't know if desire is the right word, but impetus to uh, uh, move forward and break free from their prison. He says, one group seeks their lost estate. The other knows not there is anything to seek. This includes the uh, Deva lives. The Deva lives, he says they, they, they don't know pain. They grow through appreciation and of the joy of the forms built. All the little David lives, they are builders of form and they don't have any pain, but they don't have self-consciousness, especially the lower divas. They don't have self-consciousness the way we do, but they just uh, have this impetus to build form and they get uh, satisfaction from seeing forms built. But uh, they have the advantage over us in the fact that they don't have any pain, we have advantage over them in the fact that we have self-consciousness, awareness. But like I said, it brings a lot of problems, uh, brings us into the potential to enter into quite a bit of suffering. And speaking of pain, he makes an interesting statement on pain here. He says, pain is that upward struggle through matter, which, lands a man at the feet of the Logos. Pain is the following of a line of greatest resistance. That's an interesting statement. We've often talked about two paths, a path of least resistance and the path of most resistance. 
And a lot of new age people say, go with a flow line of least resistance. Well, they got it completely backwards. Uh, to move forward in our evolution, you have to pick the pan of greatest resistance. He says, thereby reaching the summit of the mountain. Pain is the smashing of the form and the reaching of the inner fire. Pain is a cold of isolation which leads to the warmth of the central sun. Pain is a burning in the furnace in order finally to know the coolness of the water of life. Pain is a journeying into a far country, resulting in the welcoming to the father's home. Pain is the illusion of the father's disowning, which drives the prodigal straight to the father's heart. Pain is a cost of utter loss that renders back the riches of the eternal bounty. Pain is a whip that drives the struggling builder to carry utter perfection to the building of the temple. So we have three principles underlying then the law of evolution. The principle of limitation, the principle of periodic manifestation, and the principle of expansion. And in all of these, pain plays a tremendous part. Um, now, Lorraine has undergone quite a bit of pain in her life. I, of all the people here, I think she's probably uh, uh, had her share. Have you learned anything from all the things you've been through, Lorraine? Yeah. In, in the search to stop being in so much pain, I have learned forgiveness. I've learned acceptance. I've learned quite a bit, but I still can't stop the pain. Yeah, what's interesting about pain is once you're in pain, you stay, you start thinking, well, what can I do to stop this? So it at least uh, gives you uh, uh, incentive to uh, to go forward. People that live kind of carefree lives, they often don't have uh, an incentive like that. How about you, Rick? Is uh, has pain kind of given you impetus to do things in your life? Uh, yeah, to find secret relief from the pain. But <laughs> oh, you had a you had a big problem with your foot a while back. Did that ever get taken care of? No, it's just gotten worse. Really? Yeah. Oh. Okay. I can't walk very far. You know, the, from one end of the house to the other is about my limit. Yeah. Yeah, we all have, um, I think everybody here has probably had physical problems one time or another. And, uh, yeah, you really want to do what you can to find out what you can do about it. Now, there's also emotional problems. Anyone here have gone through a painful divorce? <laughs> I guess you have, haven't you, Rick? Yeah, yeah. How, would you say that's about as tough as any physical pain? The last one was, uh, <laughs> you know, when you're when you're sitting out in front of your house with all your furniture on you know, on the front lawn and uh, on account of your your spouse. <laughs> give somebody the money to pay the rent and you know and then they don't pay it and then you get kicked out it's like uh not my fault that i'm in all this pain <laughs> <laughs> yeah you come home and all your stuff is out there on the lawn that's certainly a, a wake-up call isn't it <laughs> yeah but it wasn't the spouse that did it, it was the, the fact that the the, the uh uh County sheriff came in and kicked both of us out. Really? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Nothing comes into your life uninvited. Yeah. That's true. Well, yeah, pain is a big uh, wake up call, and it's, uh, it, it lets us know that uh, we have some prison walls that we need to take down. So uh, some of them are kind of tough. But. I'm saying that. Uh, uh, 
the people know that I have the pain. I say, well, don't worry about me. The pain will go away when I learn whatever the lesson is that it's trying to teach me. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't figured out, I guess I haven't figured out what that lesson is yet. <laughs> yeah, pain's kind of funny because once we're down here, we really grumble about it. But, you know, we in the world of spirit, we actually plan this and uh, look forward to coming down here and conquering everything. And now that we're here, we find out it was harder than we probably thought it was going to be. So, uh, but the pain gives us plenty of impetus and uh, forces us to uh, uh, move ahead as, as much as possible. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions before we wrap it up here? Anybody have any uh, benefits of pain in their life they want to share with us? JJ, I had, one, I had yeah. one question kind of going back to the, towards the beginning of the lesson where you were talking about the energies, the three energies, one from the monad, one from the soul, and then the pranic energy from the sun. Yeah. In the, the Song of Eternal Life, when you talk about the energy of life, are you talking specifically about one of those energies or kind of generically about all three? Yeah, it's mainly uh, uh, focusing at the beginning on the monad and the energy coming down through the soul and then to us is kind of where the visualization should take us. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any other comments or questions? No, I was late getting here today because there was no notice received. Normally, really? Yeah, normally, normally there's a message in the molecular chat group and you just click on it and it takes you right here. It's like, well, I put it on the molecular group page. Yeah, well, somebody normally, I guess, gets it from there and puts it over on the chat because if, if uh, the chat is always open, I have the standalone oh. app. Oh, I, yeah, I didn't put it on the chat group today. I guess uh, maybe I ought to do that. I figured everybody knew to look on the molecular page, but uh, well, yeah. Well, that's where I had to go to get on here because yeah. normally it would show up, but it wasn't here today, so. Yeah, okay, you want me to put it on the chat group next week? That's the only way I'll see it. Really, I did not know that, okay. I'll uh, I'll put it on the chat group next week then. Okay, everybody, uh, uh, appreciate you being here, and hopefully we have a pain-free week coming, and we will <laughs> we will see you next Sunday about ten ten o'clock. Thanks, JJ. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, flight and love, everybody. <laughs>